Our next guest is an entrepreneur, a best-selling author, and a graduate of the Wharton School of Business. She oversaw development and acquisitions for the Trump Organization, and now she's an advisor to the president. Ivanka Trump, welcome to Axios. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Backstage, you were telling me. Hi. <laughs> uh, backstage, you were telling me what you're going to come back as. Yes, Mark's intern. <laughs> I just heard all about his uh, his trip to Disney World, and and it sounds pretty epic. So I'm I'm waiting to take my children, but uh, but but in in a future life, I think that sounds pretty pretty good. So Ivanka, behind the curtain, I was telling you that the RSVPs for this event had broken all our records in 12 years of doing conversations like this. That you've gotten more response than Bill Gates or Mark Cuban. And you said <laughs> what? That's pretty impressive. I said I said you should tell everyone that. <laughs> uh, so uh, uh, if you looked at, if you saw the crowd uh, around the block, lots of young professional women here. It's great. Very here to see you. What's the most important thing for them to know about how the workforce is changing? Well, and, and I think it's very on topic, obviously, why we're here today. And, and one of the reasons I was very excited to participate in this particular conversation is that you have been such a thought leader and such a champion on the subject of the future of work and of workforce development and, and the rapid pace in which work um, and the jobs of the future are, are evolving. So, so I was excited to come here and, and talk about this topic and, and elevate awareness around um, the skills that are required to succeed in the modern economy, um, the areas where we're not doing enough, um, both on a federal level and within the private sector, um, and, and to talk about our goals for, for how we can do better. But, but I think one of the things that's so exciting about this particular moment in time is that the economy is doing so well. It is so strong. I think the combination of tax reform coupled with deregulation, coupled with record optimism and unemployment being at the lowest level across so many categories, whether it's African-American unemployment, whether it's Hispanic unemployment, whether it's a 65-year low in women on women's unemployment, whether it's record low in unemployment for those with disabilities. There's unprecedented opportunity for people to um, not only enter the workforce and have more choices, but for them to also um, seek new opportunities within their existing careers or change their careers and, um, and have enhanced opportunities for, for mobility within their industry or to move into different industry. So it's a great time to, to be coming into the workforce, whether you're a young um, student or, or a young worker who's looking to, to really embark on their career. Um, and, and is just starting out in life, or increasingly, whether you're a mid to late career worker who's looking to learn a new trade and enter a new line of work, um, or as we saw just in the month of June, 600,000, 600,000 Americans entered or re-entered the workforce. So people are coming off the sidelines. Even if you look at the unemployment number, so of those that are unemployed, of the 6.2 million Americans that are unemployed, 32% of them are recently unemployed, which means they weren't deemed unemployed beforehand. They had stopped looking for work. They were, they were frustrated. They had, had ceased, to, um, ceased to be actively looking. So the fact that such a large percentage is now actively looking for work again shows the, the level of optimism about the ability to secure a job. I think that coupled with rising wages, it's just, it's a great, it's a great time to be looking for work. So to all of the young people in the, op, in the audience, think big, be bold. Um, obviously, early in your careers is um, the easiest time to, to take a risk, to experiment, to find out what it is that you're deeply and truly passionate about. 
And, um, and one of the lessons that I've learned um, from, all the from all the people that I've been privileged to know in my life who have succeeded at the highest levels is the people who achieve the greatest accomplishments, whether in business, in politics, um, really in any industry, in academia, are always the ones who strive the hardest, work the hardest. And the people who strive the hardest and work the hardest are those with the greatest passion for the work that they're doing. And there's nothing that replaces that. It's not intelligence. It's not natural aptitude. I've seen a lot of people with natural aptitude who plateau. Who um, don't do their 10,000 hours. <laughs> correct. And, and, and actually, it can be limiting because it's, you know, it's sort of this, um, this fixed mindset. They, they start to run away because they feel that um, once they, they're, they're exposing themselves, once they, they hit a ceiling and, um, and, and they're no longer able to progress. So um, it's the people who have to work for it and, and work hard um, and, uh, and continue to achieve. So it's, it's an exciting time. It's an exciting time to be in the workforce. And because of the health of the economy, it's an exciting time to tackle the challenges that, that we're talking about today. And as the Axios founders can tell you, every time in your career is a good time uh, to take a risk. Ivanka, two weeks ago in the East Room, President Trump, thank you for your months of work on the White House Workforce Initiative. That includes a pledge to America's workers where companies promise training yeah. to specific numbers of current and future employees, and you have some news. I do. Well, so at that, um, at that announcement, we launched two separate initiatives. The first was a National Council for the American Worker, which is a US government-led initiative to think holistically about the education and skills development of the American worker from birth through retirement. Because right now, we have so many different government training and education programs um, across 14 different agencies, over 40 different programs. There's no real accountability. There's no real rationalization of these programs. So to consolidate, to, to concentrate resources in the programs that are working, to leverage technology, for example. So right now, we have, for the first time in history, more vacant jobs than we have officially unemployed people, which is amazing. But if you ask the Bureau of Labor Statistics, OK, so where are the vacancies? They can't tell you. They can tell you what industry the 6.6 .6 million vacant jobs are in, but they can't tell you geographically where they're located and what underlying skills are required to fill them or what training programs will give you the skills to fill the vacant jobs. So there's a lot we can do in the federal government, aside from skilling people. That we think the private sector can do much better than we can, particularly for mid to late career workers. But there's a lot we can do to work with the private sector and harness big data to create transparency so people can make smarter choices about the education and the skills that they're acquiring at all stages of their life. So, so we have a lot of different initiatives with the US government-led council. But in addition to that, one of the great powers of the White House is the power to convene and the power to amplify. So we launched at um, that, um, that kickoff a pledge to America's workers. And we called upon the private sector to join us in this effort and to commit to apprenticeships, on-the-job training programs, and reskilling of their, of their existing workforce. So taking a mid to late career worker who's at risk of losing their job to automation and committing to retraining them with a skill that they have vacant in their own company. Um, which, is, which is so incredible. And we were so excited that at that launch, we worked very closely with so many great companies. Walmart committed to a million new jobs, FedEx 500,000 new jobs. We, have, we had a total at launch two weeks ago of 3.8 million new commitments all private sector driven. So it was absolutely incredible. And today, MasterCard announced an additional 75,000 in commitments. And United Airlines announced an additional 1,600 new job commitments and, and enhanced career opportunities. So we're very excited about this. And, and this is a campaign that is, is just beginning. So we encourage everyone to go back to, to their companies to, to sign our pledge to America's workers and um, to help us think um, holistically about investing in our country's greatest resource, um, 
the skills of our people. Senator Marco Rubio this week is introducing a paid family leave bill, the Economic Security for New Parents Act. You've been pushing this idea since day one of yes. the administration. Why has it been so hard? You control <laughs> all of government. Well, <laughs> so this was not exactly um, part of the Republican lexicon That's when we arrived in DC um, in January 2017. But the president was talking about the importance of paid family leave um, starting in the Republican primaries. So this wasn't you know, just an issue he was talking about in the general election. He, he had been talking about it for a long time. It was in both of his budgets. The first time a president had ever made an allocation in a president's budget for a national paid family leave plan. It was mentioned in his joint address to Congress and in the State of the Union. So we spent really the first 12 months in Washington talking to Republicans about why paid family leave is not just a mandate on business or another large entitlement program, but why it is good policy and why it has the right incentives, why it creates um, attachment to the workforce. So we're talking about job training um, and the importance of, of thinking about the future of work, but the importance of creating attachment to the workplace. You know, we're all very incentivized to, um, to, to drive up the labor force participation rates in this country. Um, and it's very important that when somebody has a job um, and then they have a life event like having a child and they want to maintain their job, that, that they're able to do so. But also, we want to support family cohesion and connectivity and bonding, um, especially at moments when people are at their most vulnerable and support the most vulnerable in, in our society, infants. In many states, um, you cannot send a child to daycare until they're 12 weeks of age. Um, institutional daycares won't accept them because so of the liabilities associated. So it just had not been, it just had not been a, there had been no Republican policies that had been surfaced. And, um, and Democrats had talked for years about the idea, but they had never brought the case to Republicans. Um, there had been Democrat uh, legislation that had been introduced. It had never been backed by the Democrat president um, at the time, um, and it didn't have the votes to be passed into law. So it just sort of sat out there for a long time without any momentum on the Hill. So I view this as a wildly bipartisan issue. I think it is in the country, and I think what's happened and what's changed is now it is on the Hill as well. So I think what we've seen over the last several months is that shift happen, where what is bipartisan in the country that paid family leave is good policy. It has to be structured in a prudent way, in a fiscally responsible way. It's becoming bipartisan in Washington as well. So Senator Cassidy, um, very importantly, held um, a bipartisan hearing in Senate finance, which is incredible. Um, Senate finance will obviously be uh, the relevant committee if this is gonna be passed into law. So for Republicans to lead on that front was great. Senator Fisher introduced in tax reform, which a lot of people don't know about, but which is very significant, a tax credit to incentivize private sector employers with employees making under, um, with to incentivize employers who pay employees making under a certain amount um, to give them a tax credit if they offer this benefit, which is a great first step um, and a great idea. Obviously, it's foundational. It's not, um, it's not a national program, but it's, um, it's a great first step. And then um, Senator Rubio is introducing legislation today, and we're looking forward um, to seeing the legislative text and, and reacting to it. Several other senators I've been talking with are also planning to introduce legislation. So I look forward to continuing to work with lawmakers on both sides of the aisle. I view this as, as something that's going to require a bipartisan compromise in order to get done. And so in other words, not in this Congress? Um, in other words, no, not in this Congress. I, I view, look, it's been 25 years since FMLA was passed, and we're still at zero weeks of pay leave. <laughs> we're the only country in the developed world that that's true of. We're the only country other than Papua New Guinea that doesn't have a program. 
um, that offers paid maternal leave. The president's called for maternity and paternity and adoptive leave, and we're working to make that happen. So, so really, at this point, we're curating ideas with the hope of being able to build consensus, but it, it, it will take time. Um, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic that it can happen next year. If you're tweeting at hashtag Axios360, Axios that's your tweet. Earlier this week, something that did pass. Earlier this week, you hopped on Air Force One and went with the president to Tampa, where the president signed what? Ah, Perkins Career and Technical. Um, Education Act, which is... So this is a technical training bill. Yes, it's a great piece of legislation that um, block grants money to the states to support career and technical education. And, and this is great because, I, you know, over the course of the last 18 months, I've, I've done a lot of traveling across the country. And um, in addition to thinking about the future of work and the increasingly digital economy and important um, skills such as computer science education, and we've done some great things. Um, uh, you know, one of the president's first actions was instructing the Department of Education to prioritize computer science and STEM education. Um, we created. Um, uh, a 200 million, a minimum of 200 million in annual grant funding. We also worked with the Internet Association to have the private sector match that um, with an additional 300 million in funds, and the grants are starting to be awarded now, which is which is great. We we've been working on a year-long effort to expand apprenticeships and to create industry-led um, certificates um, and and industry-led apprenticeships, um, which the Department of Labor is now implementing the recommendations of the task force. We've We've been doing all of these different things um, to promote vocational education, apprenticeships. Um, but Perkins, time and time again, we would hear from the business community, we would hear from governors, um, Democrats, Republicans, everyone, that this was such important legislation in dire need of modernization, um, that needed to be more responsive to the needs of the local communities, that needed to be more responsive to the skills that were in demand in the local economies um, that the money was being block granted to. So this legislation basically sat there despite almost universal consensus that it was great um, for years. Um, and this was sort of kind of Washington at its worst. Um, it just needed a champion, and, and we came together. Um, I give Senate help a lot of credit. I give Virginia Fox um, a tremendous amount of credit. Um, the White House obviously championed this hard, um, and, and we moved it through, and it was, um, it was signed into law on Wednesday, and we traveled to Tampa and visited uh, Tampa, Tampa Bay, uh, technical school to, to celebrate and, and met with some of the students there. But this legislation will benefit over 11 million students and workers and equip them with the skills they need to, to thrive in the modern economy. So it's, it's very important legislation. And, and I do think you know, this focus on vocational education is, is, is really important, and, and that word vocation is really important because I think for too long we've talked about college, and college is amazing. There is no one who will argue that college is not um, a wonderful path for many people, um, and, um, and we don't want to denigrate that decision in any way, but it is not the right path for everyone and it should not be perceived as the only path for everyone. And this administration is committed to creating alternative pathways to family sustaining jobs and prioritizing again and uplifting the role of vocational education. So this you know, work of the future requires digital literacy, but that doesn't necessarily have to take the form of four-year college. To be able to service the cloud, may require 18 months of post-secondary credentialing, not a four-year college degree. So we have to, as a, as a country, um, and certainly as an administration, we're very focused on our messaging to not imply that there's one path to a great future. And, and that's why it's important to, to talk about the role of vocational education. We also, in this country, have a great need for plumbers and electricians and welders 
And these are occupations that are incredibly lucrative and in high demand. So I think that for us and, and for me, I'm very focused on when I, when I talk about the topic of, of um, education, I talk about the topic of in-demand education. So whether that takes the form of the future of work and the, the jobs that we need to fill and cybersecurity and, and the work of the future um, where we don't yet have adequate workforce or the skills trades where we used to have workers and increasingly were unable to replace those retiring with the next generation. Um, we see that in the construction industry. We see that in you manufacturing. About, a little bit about the uh, construction industry. So we're gonna have a quick rapid round and then we have a question from sure. Jonathan Swan. Your high point and low point in the White House. Oh, wow. Oh, um, so my high point, oh gosh. I, there have been, there have been so many high points. I, I, I mean, to be, to be honest, every day, and, and you know, regardless of the intensity and the pressure, but every day I'm, I walk into the White House, and that means something. It is, it's the White House, and it's incredibly special. And I never, ever let myself forget the privilege that I have to serve our country. Uh, the, the, and um, so that's more broad, but, um, but specifically, and, and um, I just very emotionally, and this was you know, something I actually had very little to do with, um, uh, Jared and, and, and you know, the president were involved with this, but um, Alice Marie Johnson, I think, you know, seeing her leave prison and run into the arms of her family, and, and I watched it just like much of America did on television. I, I watched it on the internet and then I watched it on television. It was I, was, I was crying. It was one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. And it reminds you, it reminds you of just the real impact you have on people a lot of times. And that's why I love traveling. Um, I love getting out of Washington. Because the things we talk about, you, we talk about paid family leave, we talk about workforce development. When you talk in numbers that are so big and broad and the impact, tax reform, that was a real high moment for me. I worked really hard um, with an amazing team of people to make that happen. Um, but the impact affects millions, tens of millions of people. But it's then traveling and hearing the personal impact stories that really resonate. But that video footage of Alice was just unbelievable. Now, a low point in the White House for a number of your colleagues was the kids at the border issue. What is your view of that? Yes, um, that was a low point for me as well. I, I feel very strongly about that. And, um, and I am very vehemently against family separation um, and the separation of parents and children. So um, I would agree with that sentiment. I think immigration is incredibly complex as a topic. Um, illegal immigration is incredibly complicated. I am a daughter of an immigrant. My mother grew up in communist Czech Republic. But we are a country of laws. So, you know, she came to this country legally. And we have to be very careful um, about incentivizing behavior that puts children at risk of being trafficked at risk of entering this country um, with coyotes or making an incredibly dangerous journey alone. So it, it is, these are not easy issues. These are, these are incredibly difficult issues. And, um, and like the rest of the country, I, they're, they're, 
I, I experience them in a, in a very emotional way. So last question, then we're going to uh, have Jonathan Swan. Have you talked to Robert Mueller or his team? And did you know about the Trump Tower meeting in June 2016 before it happened? Or did you see any of those visitors? <laughs> no and no. Jonathan Swan. <laughs> Uh, the great Jonathan Swan is going to pick up on anything that I've missed, mixed or botched here. Go ahead, Jonathan. And by see any of those visitors, I assume I've seen my husband and I've seen, <laughs> and I've seen my brother, and, <laughs> but no. But you didn't talk to any of the Russian visitors when they were there? No. <laughs> Hi, Ivanka. Um, as you know, uh, workforce development doesn't happen in a vacuum. So I wanted to ask you, um, what do you say to workers whose livelihoods are threatened by the trade war, the tariffs, uh, particularly workers who actually feel that they've adapted to the 21st century economy. They're working in businesses that rely on imports and exports and feel that they're being punished uh, for, frankly, developing them, their businesses in the way that you might you know, advocate in, in this initiative. So I think it's, um, it's a very good question. and. And, and I'll share a story with you. L last week, I was um, with the president, and we went to Iowa. And, um, and we did a roundtable on the subject of, uh, of, of workforce development. Iowa has an incredibly low unemployment rate. And this is um, an urgent priority for them, as they're even reaching into their high schools. Um, to, to start to train workers earlier to, to serve the needs of their businesses and, um, and to ensure people are adequately trained for, for, for the growth that they want to have. Following that visit, we flew to Granite City, Illinois. And we went to a steel mill owned by U.S. Steel. And um, it was the celebration of an opening of that steel mill that had happened in June. And there were over 900 workers who were present. And they were sharing their stories. And these were steel workers who had been laid off roughly a year earlier and who had been told that there was no place and there was no opportunity for, for steel working in this country anymore. And this was a town where there were three, four generations who had worked in the steel mill. And some of them came up and they spoke as the president spoke and they shared their stories. And they said that their father or their mother had worked in the steel mill. Um, their grandmother had worked in the steel mill. And then it closed so abruptly. And for them to be back, back in a job, back with hope, talking about the national security element of steel, of being able to make, um, keep our military strong, of God forbid there's a war and we need to be able to produce our steel, um, to be able to, um, to support ourselves and build our ships and build our equipment. But these are tough, strong, amazing people. And to see them so emotional and so grateful for the opportunity to work because of the tariffs we're talking about, because steel had been dumped in this country um, for so long at their expense. And one of the great companies in the world, I mean, US Steel is like you know, central casting American company. It's a legacy brand. It's like what Coca-Cola is um, in, in terms of its sort of historical significance and, and, and brand value. Um, to see them talk about what it means to have their job back and to be back to work is the counter to what you say. I, I um, talking about the farmers, um, you know, the Sonny Purdue, who's amazing, is doing a great job. And he's out there every single day with our farmers. And they've seen their business. They know what's been happening. And yes, there's some certainty to the decline that they've been experiencing. It's sort of been going like this. But they've been seeing the trend. And the trend is not good, but it's predictable. And there's some comfort in predictability. But they're patriots. And they know that there's some temporary pain. 
but that the president's fighting for them and that he's going to fix it and that long term they're going to thrive. And I think you see that. I think you see that with what happened with the EU announcement last week. I think you're going to see that in the coming weeks um, with, with NAFTA and other trade deals. So I, at some point, you do have to right the ship. And we're not looking for to create an uneven playing field for other countries. We're looking for fair and reciprocal trade deals. Just, just on that steel example, I don't think anyone would disagree with you that it was moving to see the workers at Granite, the reopening of that steel furnace. And just simple economics will tell you if you put tariffs on steel and raise the steel price, it's going to help steel manufacturers in America. But there's a lot of other businesses that rely on steel and aluminum as inputs. And there are downstream effects, and we could list them. There's a Missouri nail company that's just laid, laid off workers. What do you say to those workers who are in, in, in businesses that use steel as an input, not a steel furnace? There's, there's a national security aspect to we steel production Canada? domestically Canada? as well. No, there's a national security aspect to, to steel as well. So, right. I um, want the two of you to take it outside. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we're about to get the hook here. Uh, so as we say goodbye, will you start another business? In when? <laughs> In my life? Um, I, you know, I, I'm 36 years old. So I, I, have a long, I have a long life ahead of me. And, and I don't know what it holds for me at some point. I, I will likely return to the private sector, um, but I don't have a timetable. And that's, that was the reason I took the decision that I did um, last week, because it was unfair. This was to close down your brand? Correct. It was unfair to my team, 17 months into this, to not be able to say with any certainty that I was coming back um, within a specified period of time or, or, or ever. Um, was not, I did not feel comfortable so you, with that. You might, you might live in Washington permanently? Or not go back to that business. I, I just don't know. I, I'm really passionate about the work that I'm doing here, and I'm really committed to it. I just launched um, uh, with, with the president, and I'll be overseeing the, the National Council for the American Worker, um, the beginning of this campaign with the pledge. I have several other initiatives that I'm looking forward to getting done. We just last week um, signed a um, very important piece of legislation on Perkins. I've got several other pieces of bipartisan legislation. I'm, I'm working to get over the finish line, paid family leave. Um, I'm hopeful that we're able to, to finally um, make process towards um, passing into law and, uh, and many, many other initiatives that and that's where my head is, and that's where my heart is, and, uh, and that's why I'm here. So you might spend the rest of your life in the swamp. Well, that's highly unlikely. Okay. <laughs> that, is, that is high, highly unlikely. Okay. But right. We've, We always finish with one fun thing. First, I have to ask you, we have a number of our colleagues here on the press. Do you think that we're the enemy of the people? Sorry? Do you think the media <laughs> is the enemy of the people? No, I do not. <laughs> that's not a view that's shared in your family. Are you looking for me to elaborate? And sure. No, um, no, I don't. I, how do you, how do you I mean, I, 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 certainly, I certainly have, um, I, I, I can share my own personal perspective. I've, I've um, certainly received my fair share of um, reporting on me personally that I know not to be fully accurate. Um, so I've, you know, had some, I have some sensitivity around um, why people uh, have concerns and, and gripe, especially when they're sort of feel targeted. Um, but no, I do not feel that the media is the enemy of the people. All right, we finished our newsletters and our events with one fun thing. You get home, you've had another boring day in the Trump White House. <laughs> you walk in and you see a bowl. What's in the bowl? Okay, so <laughs> this is really lame. Um, so I used to be a New York entrepreneur. I think about work-life balance. I tried to cultivate that for my team, for myself. I read a lot of books on, 
um, sort of how to marginally improve my life. And then I moved here, and I haven't exercised in like a year. Um, and it's total chaos. Um, so I finally got to the point where it was getting so frustrating for me because you know I'd go to bed, I'd you know you work and work and work, and it's so fulfilling. But then you'd come home, and my kids would be screaming, and I'd read to them, and I'd finally get the last one down. And it would be so late, and then I'd go back to work, and I'd sort of crawl into bed late at night, and I'd realize I haven't done like literally one thing for myself, um, including like eat a decent meal. Like I'd be like eating while walking or. Um, so I had read somewhere that um, as a way to create separation, I should write down things I enjoy doing that I can do in 10 minute increments and um, put them on slips of paper and put them in a bowl and put it on, my, this is so sad, um, <laughs> and put it on my bedside table. And each night when I'm looking to transition, you know, after I've put my kids to bed, before I go to work, or after I close my laptop, and you know, before I go to sleep, and like do one enjoyable thing that's just for me. And what is one fun thing you pulled out of the bowl? What's a good one? Well, so it's funny because I put like some stuff in there that I'm like, this is good for me. And so the first one I you pulled out, I crumpled up and threw out. And I'm like, you know what? This isn't the point. It was like, do like ten, like twenty squats. I'm like, no, no, no. That's not the point. Like, it's not, it's not supposed to be something that's good for me, but like totally unenjoyable, right? So I threw that one out. Um, the second one was lie in bed with earphones and listen to music. So that was great. That was a really enjoyable ten minutes. I've got meditate in there. I've got lie in a bath with a face mask on. <laughs> I've got. Um, Read, uh, read a book in bed. Um, I've got like I've got all sorts of things. Um, read poetry. I've got you know for ten minutes, and it's actually really nice. And a lot of times you end up doing it for a lot longer than ten minutes, which is even better. Um, so that's a good life hack for anyone who's not prioritizing themselves. I prioritize very well, but I'm going to put uh, some nice. Uh, uh, Fun ones in my bowl. I uh, would like to thank the Bank of America for making these illuminating conversations possible. Grateful to the Axios events team and all my Axios colleagues. Thank you, your White House colleagues, for making this possible. C-SPAN, thank all of you for coming out so early. And Ivanka Trump, thank you for visiting Axios. Oh, thank, thank you. Thank you so much. This is so thank nice. You thank you. This is thank great. You